Hello everybody, welcome back to another Engineering Statics lecture video. In this lecture video we're going to be covering the final topic of the lecture series which is moment of inertia. Now since it's the final topic that obviously means that the semester is coming to an end, so I just want to take this moment and say thank you all for the support on these videos. So moment of inertia. Moment of inertia is one of those really funny concepts where a lot of first year students have been taught it by their instructor in statics and then they come to me and say Clayton it's pretty easy to calculate, but what does it mean? Well, basically, moment of inertia is going to be a measure of how easily a body bends. Now you're saying, what? Because if we look up until this point in the entire course, we've only discussed rigid bodies, which are bodies that do not deform. And we're saying, okay, that's great. But now, spoiler alert, you're all the masters of rigid body. Everything that has to do with rigid bodies, you've conquered. Now it's time for you all to take the next step, which are bodies that actually do deform. So that's why I said this video is kind of the gate to actual engineering, because you took a very simplified assumption, which is rigid bodies, and now we are going to start talking about bodies that actually deform. Sounds like it's going to be very complicated, but it's actually not. Let's say that we have a simply supported beam with a load Q. Again, you are now the masters of rigid bodies, so you can find out the support reactions, you can find the shear diagram, you can find the bending moment diagram. So it's only logical that the next step we would take would be actually finding the deflection of this beam. Now, if we were to look at a simply supported beam, let's say a ruler, and it had some load, we know it's going to start arcing and kind of make a smiley face. So we know that the, the deflection of the beam is going to be something like this. Now, it turns out, for linear elastic materials, we can actually measure the deflection at certain points. For instance, if I wanted the deflection, which I'm going to call delta, at the midspan, I can actually calculate it using the following formula, where it's 5 times q times l to the 4, so q is our distributed load, you all know what that is, l, that's going to be the length of the beam, again, you all know what that is, and then it's divided by 384 ei. So if we were to look at this formula right here, you guys know everything in it besides two things, and that is going to be that EI term. So as we see, the bending of beams is a function of E as well as I. E is what is actually referred to as the Young's modulus, and it's related to the material that we use. It makes sense. If I were to take my ruler and bend it, well, I can only bend it this much because it's made out of cheap plastic. If I were to take something much stiffer, like my iPad, which is made of metal, I can't exactly bend it. Well, at least I don't want to try to bend it or else we would be having a very bad time. So basically, this is related to the material properties of a beam. Makes sense. If we have a stronger material, it's not going to bend as easy. For example, for steel, this would be 200,000 MPa. So as we're going to see, it's typically constant in these elastic materials. The second one, which is kind of the topic of today, is moment of inertia and it's related to the geometry of the cross-section. As we're going to see, depending on the cross-section of our beam, it's going to bend either easier or harder. The best example would be if I were to take a book and I were to bend it this way, as we can see, it's very easy to bend. But if I were to flip it over, so again, I didn't change the material properties, I didn't change the length or anything else, and I were to try and bend it now, well, as we can see, it's not really bending. Easy to bend one way, not so easy to bend the other way. So bending of beams is related to two things, material properties as well as the geometry of the cross-section. And that geometry of the cross-section is going to be the topic for today. So if we were to do a simple example of which one's easier to bend, and, and I were to have two rectangles, a purple one and a blue one, and again, they have the same dimensions, same length, same material properties, we already know that that blue one is going to be harder to bend. And the reason why is because it's actually going to have a larger moment of inertia. If we were to compare the two, we can see that the blue one is around four times as much as the purple one. So we can see that the math actually checks out. Intuitively, we know it checks out. But how exactly do we calculate this moment of inertia? Well, it's actually pretty simple. The moment of inertia, which it can also be referred to as the second moment of inertia, is basically a measure of how efficient a cross-section is at resisting bending. Now, 
The formulas for them are actually quite simple. If I want the moment of inertia about the x-axis, it's going to be the integral of y squiggle squared dA. And if I want the moment of inertia about the y-axis, it's going to be the integral of x squiggle squared dA, where x squiggle and y squiggle are the distance from the axis to the centroid of the element, and dA is going to be the area of the element. So this is going to be, or this is going to lead to the first key thing I want you all to remember about moment of inertia. If we look at y squiggle and x squiggle, it's the distance from the axis to the centroid of the element. So depending on where our axis is, the moment of inertia is actually going to change. So again, the moment of inertia is dependent on the location of our bending axis or our rotation axis. So if we were to have a scenario here where I were to have two identical beams or beam cross sections, and one of them was slightly farther away from the axis or the x-axis in this case, that would be the blue shape. And we were to look at y squiggle, well, we can see for the purple one, it'd be around this distance. But for the blue one, it's going to be much greater. And if we look at our formula for moments of inertia about the x-axis, as we can see, we're gonna take that value, that distance, and we're going to square it. So this would actually result in the blue shape having a much greater moment of inertia than the purple shape, even though they are the exact same shape. Now you're saying, Clayton, this is amazing. How can we actually do this or take advantage of this in design? Well, you see it all the time. This is why you see I-beams, or they're actually called W-shaped beams, we take a lot of that area that's in these shapes and we try to push it to the farther ends. Because typically in design, we want the moment of inertia about the centroid. So if we were to look at this shape, we know it's symmetric. So the axis that we'd want to take the moment of inertia about, it's around the center. And we want to take a lot of that area of the shape and push it as far away from the center as possible. So this is why you see beams like this. They also have other advantages in terms of strength, but we're not going to actually talk about that. You'll see for a lot of the very long span beams where we'd have a lot of deflection, this is why we use beams with such a great depth. So these beams right here, these would be something like bridge girders where they have to span maybe 30, 40 meters. So if that's the case, again, we want our shape to have a high moment of inertia so that when the cars don't go by, the beam doesn't just sag like this. That would be pretty scary. So now that we have the formula and we know what moment of inertia is, we can start calculating the moment of inertia for some simple shapes. So let's start off with a rectangle. Again, as I said, typically in design, we're mainly interested in the moment of inertia about the centroidal axis. So this would be the axis that passes through the centroid of our shape. Because as we'll see uh, later on in design, or I guess I'll see, you may not see, this is about where our shape would bend. So if we were to actually look at our rectangular cross-section here, you'd find that if this is truly linear elastic, all the area above the x-axis would be in compression, and all the area below the x-axis would be in tension. That's why we're so concerned with things about the centroid. So if we were to take our shape, and we wanted to find the moment of inertia about this x-axis, well, we know that our formula is simply going to be the integral of y squiggle squared dA. So again, the whole process here is going to be the same for centroids, where in order to solve this integral, we want to basically take a slice. So what we're going to do is say, okay, do I take a vertical slice or do I want a horizontal slice? Well, I always look at what I have in here. So right here, I have a Y squiggle. This basically means to me that I want to have my integral in terms of dy. I want a dy in my integral. It'll make my life easier. So in order to get a dy, I need a horizontal slice. So I'm going to take a horizontal slice here, and we know that y squiggle in this case is just going to be equal to y. Now, if I were to actually take that slice and kind of expand it, we already said that the height of this slice is going to be dy. Again, that's why I picked the horizontal slice. And we know that the width of the slice is going to be b. If we were to look at our entire rectangle, it doesn't matter where this slice is, it's always going to have a width b. Now this is nice because dA, which is going to be the area of the slice, is simply just going to be b times dy. So I can substitute that into my integral over here to get b times y squared and integrate that with respect to dy, which gives me this. And then we figure out that the moment of inertia about the x-axis 
is going to be equal to base times height cubed divided by 12. I guarantee you by the end of your engineering careers, you will have this memorized. <laughs> Everyone does. Now for the y-axis, it's going to be the exact same thing. The only thing is, is I'm going to look at this and say, okay, since I have an x squiggle, I want a dx. And a dx actually corresponds to a vertical slice. So I'm going to take this green vertical slice and we'll get the following relationship for the area. And if I were to do the integral, I'm going to get height times base cubed divided by 12. Now this starts to explain why if we take a shape and we were to orientate it this way, it bends a lot easier than if we were to take a shape and bend it this way. Look at the terms here. We have a height cubed. So if the height is much greater, well, it's going to go almost exponentially up compared to the base, and that's going to make a big difference. So we can conclude that the moment of inertia for a rectangle about the centroidal axis is just going to be base times height cubed divided by 12 for the x-axis, and height times base cubed divided by 12 for the y-axis. As we can see, this is a piece of cake you're all laughing. So yeah, that's it for this video. I want to thank you guys so much for listening. I really appreciate it. I hope you guys have a wonderful day, and I will see you in the next video.